1947. My dad gets involved with some friends. He, they were going to start a radio station in Las Vegas. And the governor of the state of Nevada, he was going to be there for the opening of the radio station. And that's when he got the knock on the door. My dad opens the door. He's at home getting dressed. And it's a fellow by the name of Al Schwimmer and Reynolds Selk. He invites him in, of course. He says, I don't have much time. What's on your mind? What are you doing here? And that's when they tell him the story, the story of Israel. First of all, he swears him to secrecy. My dad, he swore to himself, if I can ever do anything to fulfill my grandfather's dream of Zionism, a place, a homeland for the Jews, then I will do my part. Right away, he said, of course, I'll help. I can be ready in about two weeks. They said, oh, no, 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 this isn't, you don't have time to get ready in two weeks. You got to go tonight. You're going to Hawaii tonight. Why am I going to Hawaii? Because there's a nice Jewish man who has a, a armed uh, war surplus depot with lots of airplane parts, whatever. You're going to go down there and get all that stuff and ship it up to Los Angeles so we can get on with this. Here's your ticket. So he gets to Hawaii. Nathan Liff was the man who had the war surplus yard. But my dad told him what he was doing. Nathan said, take whatever you want. So my dad looked around, saw lots of airplane engines and spare parts, things like that. And he looked just beyond the yard. It was a huge fence, cyclone fence, and two Navy Marine guards guarding it. He said, I wonder what's there. So that night, they cut a, a hole in the fence, he and a couple of friends, and they went through into what was a Navy depot. They opened the crates full of brand new machine guns and ammunition, whatever, whatever you need to defend yourself in a war, for sure. And he figured that Israel needed that more than they needed airplane engines. So instead of staying for two days, he stayed for two or three weeks. And every night when the Marine guards would head off in a different direction, they would go through the fence with forklifts. And they stole tons and tons and tons of machine guns, all kinds of weapons, all kinds of ammunition. Brought it into Nathan Lift's yard, moved them into crates marked aircraft engines, and then shipped them back to Los Angeles. They come back to Los Angeles, and of course they know they're violating the law, and they know that the feds are hot on their trail. So my dad makes arrangement with this fellow who has a boat. They're gonna load all these weapons on his boat. He makes his deal with this guy who owns the boat, they load the boat up all night, all these volunteers, and by early morning, the portholes are underwater because it's so heavy. The guy says, I'm not, you're not taking my boat, you're gonna sink it. It's too heavy. So my dad made a command decision that he made a lot, I think, during the war. He pulled out his gun, stuck it to his head, and said, you got five seconds to change your mind or I'm gonna lighten the load. So the captain said, uh, okay, I'll go. He, he made a smart move, he didn't want to die. And they took the boat all the way to Mexico. And they offloaded the weapons. And now my dad had to get the weapons from the west side of Mexico to the east side, to Tampico Bay, so they could sail them out to cross the ocean. So he gets over to Tampico Bay, goes to the ship's captain, who decides he's not gonna sail this stuff. He's not taking it out. My dad has the same gun in the same pocket, does the same routine, and the boat sailed. And it goes to Haifa. The boat that sailed to Haifa provided the wherewithal for the Israelis to break the siege of Jerusalem. I didn't know this part of the story until much, much later. It's 2008, nine, somewhere in there. We were interviewing uh, Shimon Peres for a documentary we did. And Shimon talks about how he was there in Haifa, waiting for that ship like they were waiting for the Messiah.